Peter Michaels is bringing back the old movies, but with such rare richness that it's garnered a lot of attention here on cable TV. And he is our very special guest here on Connecticut News Talk. I've gotten letters from young people, old people. Uh, the first response is you, you brought back memories. We have something we haven't seen in years, and there's depth to them. Other people have stayed away from them. You know, uh, how we feel about something is not, it doesn't usually depend uh, on whether it's good or bad, but our introduction to it. And childhood is a good backdrop. And a lot of people began watching horror, if you want to call it, fantasy, in their childhood. And it's, and they've seen these now, once again, as they're adults, and find out there's far more depth in them than they ever imagined. And people still love them. Yeah, well, yes, and I said, plus some of the films we show are based on H.G. Wells, uh, Jules Verne, uh, the classics. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, intro the first clip. Robert Block, who's a wonderful author, he's written far more than Psycho, and our horror expert uh, is Forrest J. Ackerman. Well, the reason for the preservation of all of these artifacts and memorabilia is that a great number of them are one of a kind. When they're gone, there'll be no other source of supply, nothing that the uh, historian of films or of uh, fantasy literature will be able to uh, find anywhere else. There's information uh, files, the form of print and uh, form of photographs that are unavailable elsewhere. And uh, heaven knows, the historical societies of every state and of many large cities have vast collections which have been acquired at great pain and expense. And here's Forey sitting with this mountain of accumulation gathered over a period of almost 60 years and uh, there is just no uh, present anticipation that's going to be preserved intact. I spent many years as a copywriter in an advertising agency, and I've watched people launch their careers, know who was responsible for launching them, and seen them whiz away, never to return to the sources with any kind of acknowledgement, because they were uncomfortable in the presence of such people who knew them when, as it were. I wish it were not that way, but this is almost, in quotes, human nature, unquote. That's the kind of film you'll see here on cable television if you happen to see Michael's movie Madness. He's our very special guest, uh, Peter Michaels. What are some of the themes, and which ones are liked, which ones aren't in these horror uh, flicks? Well, that's, uh, <laughs> what are the themes? There are endless themes and implications. Some of the major ones. Well, Frankenstein, uh, if it depends on who you talk to. Is it about adolescence? Is it about man uh, trying to be God? Is it a science fiction? Is it a fable? The scope is so large, that's why we generally call these fantastic films. Uh, it's been called horror films, which was termed in 1931 for Frankenstein. Universal had to come up with something. And it was, it was Boris Karloff who detested that, because horror dictionary means revulsion. How do you like that? How do I like the phrase? The phrase. Horror. Well, How does that, you know, it, it, it's you? come into being, I can't think of anything else. But he always assumed a terror film, because they were based, again, on Grimm's Tales. But horror film is the wrong term, and we get uh, one of the reasons maybe why the Foy Ackerman Museum hasn't happened. But a catchy it, term, though. Yes. Do you think there's too much violence, perhaps? Today or then? <laughs> today, in today's sense of the word. Uh, the fact that they were produced many years ago. No, I do not. Uh, there's been talk of uh, putting lost footage together, which uh, certain scenes that may have been too violent. Uh, I don't believe they were. If, if you look at today's films, I'm afraid, I don't mean to insult certain directors and writers, a lot of it is garbage, and I find it pornography. Those are gore films. Okay, we have another clip they would like to uh, Yes, show. this is Dr. Asimov, uh, taken in New York City. Again, his personal reflections on Forrest J. Ackerman and the worth of the collection. All right, we now go to that uh, clip. The goal of this stuff here comes from the collection of Forrest J. Ackerman. And Forrest J. Ackerman is part of my long distance past, too. He's five years older than I am. If you can possibly believe that anyone can be five years older than I am. And he fell in love with science fiction when he saw, as I understand it, the first issue of Amazing Stories on the Stand. It was the first, it was the first magazine to be devoted entirely to science fiction. And that won over Fari. He became a fan, and he stayed a fan. He's not one of these guys who goes around saying, oh yeah, I used to read that when I was a kid. 
He read it when he was a kid. He read it when he was an adolescent. He read it when he was a young man. He read it when he was a middle-aged man. He reads it now as a decrepit old man. <laughs> he undoubtedly has the largest collection of science fiction, fantasy, horror, movies, as well as books, anything, costumes, uh, everything, the things you see here, the sort of thing he collects. He's got the largest the world has ever seen. And he should have made a museum out of it, but I believe he tried. But for one reason or another, the city of Los Angeles didn't cooperate properly. Remember that all of this is the responsibility of Forrest J. Ackerman, widely known and justly so as Mr. Science Fiction. You're watching Great Entertainment here on Connecticut News Talk. Our very special guest is Peter Michaels of Michaels Movie Madness. He has his own special show on cable television. And you take this whole thing rather seriously. Uh, you have to watch the show. I do everything but drop my pants and a duck flies out. I don't do what so many horror show hosts, I don't like the term, but do. They make fun of the films and people that sacrifice their lives to them. That's what we don't do. Uh, as Robert Block had said, Isaac Asimov, it's, it's history. And if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that we don't learn anything from it. But speaking of respect, I should tell you that, and speaking of Bale goes, one of the things we do give out on the show are these Dracula soil pendants. Can you see these, ladies and gentlemen? Soil taken from the Carpathian Mountains in Bavad's Castle. We were going to give this to you, Al, because Barbara said we couldn't do the show without it. These are, we give these to people who write in basically serious letters for Forrest, Acker, for Forrest J. Ackerman Museum, which comes rather with the ever boring certificate of authenticity, uh, which I don't know who proved this. And also, I know you want to be a card carrying member of the Bela Lugosi Society. Congratulations, Al. I thank you very much. You can I go will to school treasure with this a, for the rest of my life. I had. I really <laughs> appreciate this. I, uh, I'm awed. I don't know what to say. Oh, can I have the show now? <laughs> Okay. It's I your show. Um, to continue on, what show. can some of your fans uh, look forward to in some of your upcoming shows? Uh, we go to the low films, camp films of Plan 9 from Outer Space, but then we go to the, what I consider high art, uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which was filmed in 1919. And again, people think a silent movie. People run around like morons. Well, that's because silent films are generally broadcast at 24 frames per second. They were shot at 18. We show silent films the way they were meant to be seen with pacing, with, with good lighting, and there's depth. Uh, again, Lost Films with the Lugosi. We're showing a serial, The Return of Shandu, which uh, it's really fun to see those kind of things. Not only do you gain an audience, want to see what happens, but they're done with, if not with a great deal of money, with a great deal of passion. <laughs> and uh, science fiction as well, uh, Metropolis, one of the all-time classic films. And, uh, do you like anything other than horror films? Yes, definitely, yes. So a lot you're of just people, hung up on well, horror. No, I'm, a lot of people, when I walk in the room, think I'm going to give them Lugosi shoe size. And this is not the biggest How does your horoscope read? You've been talking to Forey Ackerman. Okay. Um, that was unrehearsed, so that's natural. We know, well. folks. Um, <laughs> How does it read? How do you see yourself? How do I, where do I see myself going? I feel like Barbara Walters. Go ahead. Well, that's the code. <laughs> Uh, where do I see myself going? Probably off the air very soon. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm trying very hard. Like I said, I originally Can wanted... Can you read yourself? Can you read your own signs? When? Can you read your own auras? Where, where are you do going you with this? Do you think, perhaps, that there's something from the past that's luring you into this whole, you know, skit? I have always been endeared by older people. My grandfather was my favorite person in the world. Uh, Things from the past mean a lot to me. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Bob Bach last night, and uh, he is not giving up screenplays. So what's the point? And I said, you know, you're the most famous for writing Psycho. You never wrote the screenplay, Psycho 1, Psycho 2, Psycho 3. Why? He said, well, when I walk into an office, they see a pot belly, I'm balding, I'm uh, near 70. Uh, age is, <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, age is very important. Uh, I respect the past. And the younger people, people my age in Hollywood who don't, uh, their point is well taken if we all die at 38. Then that makes all sense. I don't plan on dying at 38. How long does it take to put one show together? It's sometimes we, I get here the minute before airtime because I'm unfortunately a perfectionist. Doesn't mean my show is a perfect. A perfectionist a minute before airtime? I cannot take a click. 
if I do it, I do it sometimes documentaries about the films, and I have to do, Forrest Ackman will talk, Robert Bach will talk, I'll have to show clips, go to the library, get paintings, and overdub sound. And I don't like, I don't want anybody to say, oh, it's public access, the camera shakes, which I do quite often, but I try to make it as good as I can. Being a perfectionist, I know that I am never reach it. But that's, I'm, I'm always at the last minute because I always have to do something new to it. It takes a long time. What are the people saying about you, your viewers? What do they tell you personally? <laughs> Besides the insults? People seem to be very, very enthusiastic. We've gotten a lot of letters, and I'm really happy uh, for the letters. Head size increased? Uh, no, as a it, <laughs> wise guy. <laughs> I, I don't have that much of an ego, to tell you the truth. I, I almost blew it a few weeks ago. I, I told the viewers, I said, stop writing me that you like the show. Where the hell are the letters? Because it's more important. To have the writing? To, to write f about this museum. It's a give and take thing. I, I feel like I'm doing something for the public. I'm giving them something. I'm not getting paid for this. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to be on Carson tomorrow. Uh, but uh, no, my ego has not uh, increased. I have a great inferiority complex, which is probably, if the show is any good, that may be part of it. <laughs>